Hello there, Kev P here. If you know me at all, you know I generally prefer not to make Social Issue 101 videos because there's often already too much out there which fills that role, and I feel like this constant need to repeat what's already been said before moving on to one's point simply serves to slow down the discourse and impede progress. Call me elitist, but I'm generally quite happy for cis white men to do all the basic my first racism videos so I and other people of colour can build from that without repeating the things we're asked to explain to white friends and acquaintances on a regular basis. People are more likely to listen to cis white men talk about these kinds of things, funnily enough, rather than the people who actually experience them. And in a way, that suits me just fine, because it means I can save my breath for more interesting things. Having said that, the subject of decolonization is something which I plan to talk about in future videos, and while writing the scripts for those videos, I had trouble finding a nice brief explanation of what decolonization is to link you all, so I figured if you want something done right... You might have heard the term decolonization at some point before. The concept has slowly been coming a buzzword during the current culture wars. To give a few examples you might be aware of, in the world of politics, Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto for Labour during the 2019 election included a pledge to create an emancipation educational trust to ensure the historical injustices of colonialism and the role of the British Empire is properly integrated into the national curriculum to teach powerful black history, which is also British history. And in international diplomacy, the United Nations has declared this current decade, 2010 to 2020, the third international decade for the eradication of of colonialism, given that the previous two international decades for the eradication of colonialism have been deemed insufficient. Yeah. This decree was made in 2010, and by the looks of things, including the result of the 2019 UK election, I think it's safe to say we can look forward to a fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism very soon. But what does this all mean? What exactly is decolonization? Well, the Oxford Dictionary definition of decolonization in itself is a good example of why decolonization of every aspect of society is so important to shaping our view of the world. Decolonization. Noun. The action or process of a state withdrawing from a former colony, leaving it independent. Now, it's worth noting that even despite the need of the dictionary to be concise in its definitions, what is written here is a drastic oversimplification of decolonization in the minds of basically anyone involved with it. Yes, a big part of decolonization involves the colonizing country starting off again, but decolonization does not end the moment a colonized nation is declared to be independent and physically withdrawn from. And I have to say, trust a British dictionary to even vaguely imply that it does. Well, we're no longer actively stealing from them, so that's a job well done, lads. Carry on, carry on. The major English language dictionaries are notorious for upholding the status quo through their minimalistic definitions. For example, their passive implications that derogatory language used to describe white people has the exact same socio-historical weight and impact as, say, the N-word. If we look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary definitions for the N-word versus the, um, H-word here, the same language is used to describe them. Insulting and contemptuous. Thankfully, the online version contains some additional usage notes for the n-word below the general definition which contextualizes the word somewhat, but it's unlikely that print versions will have the space to provide the nuance necessary to make this clear. And regardless of the nuance, the fact that two words with obviously very different socio-historical weight behind them, as shown by the additional notes in the online version for the n-word, are described in their initial definition as though they're comparable in any way is laughable. And yet, when regular people look to dictionaries for a general idea of a word, it tends to be these first one or two lines which are used to equate one word with another. As you can see, the English dictionary has some baggage of its very own to unpack when it comes to the language it uses to describe oppressive structures and systems. So the general dictionary definition of decolonization is too simple for us clever and discerning people, it seems. I suppose if we're to define decolonization in any meaningful sense, we should start with colonization, eh? Again, the general definition is pretty obvious, right? A country goes to another country and makes it a colony. Australia, for instance, was made a colony of the United Kingdom when England went there and decided it was. Of course, there's more involved than just deciding you own a block of land. To colonize a place and a people involves subjugating the local population and asserting your dominance over it. A large part of colonization is about taking advantage of not just the extra territory, but also the resources and manpower that the nation has to offer. Colonized populations are often used specifically for the purpose of the colonizing nation achieving its goals of acquiring wealth and power through the exploitation of their native lands. I truly wish we could say we as a society didn't do this anymore. 
So for the colonizing nation to simply remove itself from the territory which it has colonized, and in many cases change the geographical boundaries for its own purposes, is not enough to undo the damage of colonization, or to decolonize, as it were. It leaves behind it a gaping hole of wealth and prosperity that could have been, people who could have lived, intergroup conflict which could have been avoided, and leadership which could have been left unpoisoned by often culturally incompatible norms and ideals. For a country to decolonize, it needs to have the tools at its disposal to be able to pick itself back up and deal with the damage inflicted by the years of colonial rule to both the environment and the society. So long as the nation still needs to lean on other countries, particularly the colonizing country, in a way that it didn't need to before, decolonization has not been successful and more needs to be done. So how is this kind of thing really playing out on the global stage? Well, nations which were former colonies but are now technically independent, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, are still working off huge debts that were enforced upon them by their colonial oppressors and continue to grow immensely with inflation, while at the same time struggling to re-establish themselves as autonomous nations and deal with the internal conflict resulting from the chaos of sudden colonial withdrawal. The word undoing plays an important part in the concept of successful decolonization. As I mentioned before, for decolonization to truly succeed, the damage caused by colonial and post-colonial policy must be mitigated. After all, if you've looted and pillaged a nation of its assets and wealth, you can't exactly expect it to compete with you in the modern global marketplace, can you? And people from colonizing nations wonder why formerly colonized nations struggle after they leave, concluding that they, the colonizers, just manage their wealth and resources better, choosing not to reflect upon where exactly that wealth and richness came from in the first place. <laughs> Galaxy brain material right there. So how exactly does decolonization work? Well, I guess you could separate the different strategies into those carried out on a broader, more systemic scale by a nation's government, or macro solutions, and those which can be achieved on a more focused or individual level, micro solutions. Let's take a look at some of these now, shall we? Beyond allowing a colonized nation its independence and autonomy, decolonization on a macro scale can include government actions such as making public acknowledgement that a wrong was committed by the colonizing nation, granting reparations for damages done to past and present generations, forgiving debts that were accrued or coerced during or in the aftermath of colonization, and so on and so forth. As you can see, most macro solutions tend to involve either conceding power, wealth, or resources to the colonized nation, so you can probably figure out why governments have thus far been largely reluctant to cooperate with these kinds of decolonization efforts. We can rally and protest for awareness of these issues and for systemic solutions, but it's hard to see why governments that continue to benefit from their past atrocities would feel any moral inclination towards making things right. After all, if they didn't put the system in place themselves, they would reason, why should they be held accountable today? In response to this, we could wonder why the colonized nations, who also did not put the colonial system in place themselves, should have to continue suffering from the colonial debts placed upon their ancestors. Arguments that imply colonial oppression is a thing of the past are flawed, so long as the effects are still ongoing. So what can we do to help decolonization efforts? Well, apart from the more government-friendly, i.e. largely functionally useless, global human rights organizations such as the United Nations, there are more localized grassroots organizations like the Comité Boricua en la Diaspora in Puerto Rico and Banco Cran ASBL in Belgium, which do hard work in holding governments and other institutions accountable for their colonial messes. Some groups focus on lobbying to restore lost culture to communities which have had their resources, wealth, and cultural artifacts pillaged or coerced by colonizers. Others promote awareness raising of the colonial and post-colonial struggles faced by these nations in their diaspora, holding workshops and seminars for all kinds of institutions, including government bodies. Given their inherent lack of financial ties to any governmental organizations, many of these groups need continued financial backing and volunteer lobbyists to help them in their goals. If you have any means towards supporting them, be it through your labor or your money, I'm sure it would go a long way. Having said that, I do understand that not everyone has the means to donate or the demeanor to physically get out into the fray with regards to these kinds of things. So an aspect of decolonization I prefer to explore on top of my regular fundraising efforts is even further on the micro level, with solutions that you and I can endeavor to carry out in lieu of or on top of more large-scale activism. I believe that we can all do our bit to decolonize our countries. A huge part of what is required of us in this regard is to actively strive to learn about the more shameful aspects of our nation's history, which is often spun in a way to either make us look good or to minimize the impact of our harmful actions in the past and present against other nations over which we've exerted control. Decolonization on a more micro scale can include things such as recontextualizing the way that we look at colonized nations, their residents and diaspora, understanding the modern problems facing formerly colonized nations as a direct result of both being colonized and the process of becoming independent, and re-examining the language that we use to talk about our own and other cultures. 
As you can see, these solutions I've mentioned are largely about awareness and education. Of course, we shouldn't be alone in facilitating our own education in this regard, and governments aren't the only institutions which need to work towards decolonizing themselves. Educational institutions such as schools and museums also play important roles in amending our past errors and preventing future travesties, as well as becoming self-aware about the often racist structures and ideologies upon which the institutions themselves were founded. The knowledge imparted by these institutions, and how they impart this knowledge, informs us, the public, about the world around us. And if they're providing an outdated or misleading narrative about it, then we are limited in how we as individuals can improve on a larger scale. Unlike with governments, the individual often holds more power to sway educational institutions through our feedback and suggestions. If enough voices call for updating the descriptions of a museum exhibit, for instance, the museum will be in a better position to justify allocating funding towards this process. On a much more personal level, there is a concept of decolonizing the mind, a form of intellectual decolonization from the ideas and cultural imperialism of the colonizer which have made the colonized people feel as inferior as they have been treated. This can be as simple as celebration of one's cultural value and identity through cultural activities such as festivals and promotion of one's cultural languages and music. There is increasing call for this to be promoted as a way of combating imperialism in the modern age, given the slow response of governments to enact meaningful change. And this is especially relevant for people who have historically been enslaved or subject to genocide by colonizing nations. In fact, as a part of this, there are many people who find some empowerment in researching their family roots in order to find out what culture and languages they should even be celebrating. So, that was a lot, wasn't it? To summarize all this again, colonization is more complex than one nation taking over another nation as a colony. Decolonization is more complex a process than simply withdrawing the colonizing nation from its former colony. Solutions to decolonization can include macro solutions, which are systemic actions largely undertaken by governments, and micro solutions, which are more based on individual efforts. Macro solutions can include, but are not limited to, acknowledging fault and or crimes, forgiving debts, reparations, and returning cultural assets. Micro solutions can include, but are not limited to, supporting grassroots lobbyist groups through volunteering or funding, self-educating with regards to the language you use and the history of your and other cultures, and so on and so forth, encouraging educational institutions to update and recontextualize what knowledge they impart and how they impart it, decolonizing the mind, which is especially valuable for restoring agency to people who've suffered under colonial mindsets. I want to point out that this was just a very basic explanation of some of the aspects of decolonization that I personally am likely to explore in future videos, and not a comprehensive explanation of decolonization as a concept. Because yes, as you've probably noticed by now, it's a pretty big subject! I hope at this point you understand the concept of decolonization a little better, or at least enough to follow along in my future videos which talk about decolonization in a more specific and, in my mind, interesting context. I especially can't wait to share my research into the role of the museum in the decolonization process, which has taken me around the world to a number of different cultural institutions. It's gonna be a treat! If you're intrigued about the concept of decolonization, but don't know how you can help, I hope you'll stick around and look forward to these videos. After all, above everything, I truly believe that the first and most important thing for us to decolonize is up here. Will you join me? <laughs> I'm really sorry about that one, but stay tuned anyway.